way up a mountain. In the end, it took 10 years to complete. To meet the most ambitious goal of the Great Leap Forward, Mao told the Chinese that production of steel had to double in one year. And instead of producing this just from heavy industry, the energy and idealism of the peasants was to be mobilized again. Small furnaces were built in villages and backyards across the country. They collected any scrap they could find. They melted down doorknobs, wash basins, tools. As the fever grew, people gave up their cooking walks. Ho Jinghua had never made steel before, but used her ingenuity. When we built our own furnaces, it was hard to reinforce them. Earth on its own wasn't strong, but we didn't have enough straw. I had a long pigtail, so I cut it off and snipped it into short pieces and mixed it with the earth in the furnace wall. Many of the other women cut off their hair as well. Ho Qinghua's husband, Lian Qian Yun, also filmed at the time, was just as enthusiastic. The two of us competed really hard. If my team produced three tons of steel a shift, her team would make over three tons. And then I would encourage my team to think of ways to beat that. Forests were decimated to fuel the furnaces 24 hours a day. All over China, almost everyone, even medical doctors, neglected their normal jobs to answer the call. But even those taking part began to see it was folly. All we did was make steel and nothing else. We didn't produce anything useful. How could we? We dug holes in the ground and tried to produce steel. It was all such a waste of time. But the orders came from above. We had to obey them. Slowly, it became clear that after so much effort and time, after so much wood had been burned, and so many pots and pans consigned to the flames, the steel produced was impure, weak, and useless. The full effect of the disastrous experiment began to be seen in 1959. While the peasants had been making steel, they had done little else. Crops had rotted in the fields. Seed hadn't been planted. Food was already short. Because of the falsely exaggerated harvest, the government had taken a bigger share of the crops to send to the cities. A drought made the problem worse. In 1960, the scarcity turned into a major famine. National food production fell more than 25 percent. Local secretary Loa Shifa had been away from his village studying at a party school. When I came back from Beijing, I saw that many people had bloated stomachs from starvation. We had 1,600 starving people in our commune. Some were falling over with weakness and just lying in the road. Others died. 
When the peasants saw me, they began to cry. I cried too. They said to me if I'd gotten there any later, they might all have been dead. In a secret report, the party later admitted the full extent of the calamity. Their own figures showed that over 20 million had died from the famine. It was almost certainly more. The new graves in the burial grounds confirmed that the Great Leap had failed. Revolutionary enthusiasm hadn't been enough. In the aftermath, Mao kept to the side and let the president, Liu Shaoqi, run the country. Even Mao knew that the economy had to be protected from his revolutionary zeal for the time being. So more cautious targets were set. Large communes were abandoned. Chinese peasants were allowed some land again and could sell their produce in free markets. They were allowed to live as families and return to a more normal life. Revolutionary rhetoric was toned down. There were fewer slogans. But Mao was biding his time. He feared his revolution was losing steam and he was losing control. He saw a privileged bureaucratic class emerging as had happened in the Soviet Union. He feared the return of capitalism and materialist incentives and believed China's chance to have a perfect socialist society was passing. Mao's supporters printed a book of quotations from his political speeches and writings and used them as the basis for a new attack on what was called the capitalist road. We still have to wage a protracted struggle against bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideology, said Mao. As he tried to regain power, Mao used a piece of spectacular political showmanship to revive his reputation. <laughs> To demonstrate his vigor at the age of 72, he led a mass swim across the river Yangtze. The thousand-year-old Beijing opera was Mao's next target. He wanted to break the thinking and attitudes of old China, and he began with her traditional culture. If the opera could be changed, then anything could be. Eight new revolutionary plays were written to replace the old stories of emperors and concubines. Dong Xiangling, who once played princes, now played an officer in the People's Army. I was chosen to play this revolutionary role, and it was a great honor. As artists, we were engineers of human souls. We didn't just perform to earn money, but had a serious responsibility to re-educate people. We were so happy that Chairman Mao was creatively involved in this opera. In August 1966, Mao unleashed the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. He was assisted by a group later known as the Gang of Four, which tried to build the Mao cult to new heights. In school, children recited his message to them. 